Welcome back everyone, this is Dave from Corman Productions, here to talk about This Is Us, Season 5, Episode 8, In The Room. Another excellent episode for the season. Before going any further, I will remind everyone that this is not a spoiler-free video, so if you haven't yet watched the episode, I highly recommend that you do so, and then come back and watch my video. There was a lot to be happy about within this episode. They avoided some potential narrative landmines that would have made me angry. First up, they did not kill Madison. There's been ample speculation that Madison was actually going to end up dying in childbirth. Now, that seems a little too dark for this series, but I could also see the creators going in this direction. And... I could actually see that having some narrative merit, but still, I would have absolutely hated it because I like Madison, and I am invested in Kevin and Madison's relationship. The other potential pitfall in this episode was the birth mother for Kate and Toby's potential child changing her mind at the last minute. They have avoided that narrative cliche up until this point, but I was afraid they were going to do it in this episode, which would have made me really mad. And unlike potentially killing Madison, it would have had no merit whatsoever for me. It just would have made me mad. It is such a cliche and very much beneath this show. All in all, this was an immensely satisfying episode. But I did have a few quibbles here and there, and I will be getting into it as we talk about this episode. So without further ado, let's dive in. We start off the episode in Albuquerque, New Mexico, 1963. And okay, I guess we're starting this off video off with a nice old rant. I actively hate when the creators do what they do with this in this episode. It's not the first time. Who we see right here is Nazir Ahmad, the inventor of the very technology that the big three use to communicate within this episode. This reminds me of the immaculate reception from the season premiere of season 3. Or the thread in the most recent rewatch video that I did where we had a story with the fireman that brought Randall to the hospital. Are these scenes really necessary within this episode? I get that this is your thing. I get that you're trying to make a broader point. But really... None of these scenes are necessary within this episode. Which brings me to another point. Another big quibble with this season in general and not just this episode. In the season finale last year, we had a thread with the character that ended up being Madison's doctor. And he was supposed to be a major character this season. Now my understanding, my limited understanding is that the coronavirus ended up making the creators 86 the story. Fine, but is there any reason that that Doctor character could not have appeared in this episode? I can't think of one. When you are creating a movie and a television show, you have a finite amount of time to tell a story. All these narrative dead ends, which admittedly all series to a certain extent have threads that go absolutely nowhere add up. We could have used that time to maybe flesh out Miguel for instance. How Miguel and Rebecca got together which is a story that still has yet to be told. By not having that doctor character at least show up in this episode we make 
that story in that episode with him completely pointless. There is so much ground that we have yet to cover. So much unexplored territory that wasting time like they do in this episode with these scenes is actively annoying to me now. After the credits, we cut to Jack and Rebecca getting ready to go to the cabin. But the kids don't want to go. They want to go sleep at their friends' houses, something that Jack is objecting to, until Rebecca takes him to a side and suggests that maybe not having the kids around for the trip might not be such a bad thing. They could have a little romantic get-together time. Rebecca's logic is sufficiently compelling to make Jack change his mind, and thus the kids are off the hook. And this is the last time we will see the kids for this episode. We cut to Rebecca and Miguel at the cabin. Rebecca is trying to reach Kevin, but all she's getting is his voicemail, so she has absolutely no idea whether he made his flight or not. And Rebecca says, can you imagine if he misses this? And Miguel rather confidently says, he won't. And Miguel points out that at least Randall and Beth got in touch with Madison, so she won't be alone. And Rebecca says this is true, but she doesn't seem too comforted. And she says that she is supposed to be there with the kids. And she glances at a painting on the wall. Miguel notices this. And we cut to Beth and Randall in the car. Beth is now driving while Randall is talking to Madison via video chat. Madison suggests that they could totally hang up if they, if they would like to get some sleep somewhere. And Beth poo-poos that idea, saying she doesn't want to catch COVID from some random hotel. And Randall says, Madison, for the 20th time, we are not hanging up. And you know what? I don't think this is an exaggeration on his part. He says, we are with you until Kevin gets there. And Randall suggests, if anything, she's doing them a favor by providing some entertainment for their 14-hour drive. Randall goes on to say, I know this isn't how you imagined your babies being born. But I do believe that Kevin is out there trying to get to you. And he will get there in time to see your unfairly gorgeous babies being born. But if for some reason Kevin doesn't, you have two live birthing experts at your disposal. Madison hears Randall get a text. And she thinks it might be from Kevin. But apparently, it's the family group chat. Kate giving a live update about the birthing mother's delivery, which at this point is no news at all. She's only two centimeters dilated and nothing is happening. We cut to Toby, who is hanging outside of his car in the hospital parking lot, and he looks like he's basically tailgating the birth. He gets the group family texts and gets annoyed. He calls up Kate and says, hey look, if I'm going to miss the birth because basically the coronavirus restrictions means only one person can be in the room with the birth mother, at the very least, you can give me personalized updates. And right now, Toby would get, be getting personalized updates of no news. Kate tells him that she will update him when there's something worth updating her him for and asks about his list which we don't know what that's about yet he says it's coming along but there's absolutely nothing on his pad the nurse enters the room the nurse's replacement which means that they have been there for an entire nurse's shift the nurse eventually makes a comment about Ellie being mom which Ellie then has to point out that Kate is the mom. She's just a person with a growing specimen in her who is serving her eviction notice. 
and that when the baby is born, Kate will be the first one to hold her. We cut to the past timeline with Jack and Rebecca entering the cabin. And Rebecca is going on and on about how she's happy she's not going to be hearing the kids. She's not going to have to listen to Kate go on and on about the latest 90210. Which she can't tell if the show is terrible or if Kate's just simply not very good at telling her about it. Or listening to Randall and Kevin bicker about everything. And for some reason... Jack seems bothered by Rebecca talking about this. We don't know why just yet. They are eventually upset to notice a leak in the roof. We cut to the present day timeline with Miguel and Rebecca at that same cabin. And she's standing in the same corner trying to get a signal. Miguel has brought out a bunch of board games. Some of which we've actually seen before. Most notably, in the Season 1 episode, The Trip. Miguel sees her sitting in the corner, and he asks jokingly, Did you put yourself in a timeout? And no, once again she is trying to get a signal. Miguel asks him, asks her rather, if she would rather go upstairs and watch some TV. And she rather anxiously says no. She wants the kids to get back to her with updates. Actually, more importantly than that, she would rather be with these kids. And then she says she would like a cocktail, which makes Miguel laugh. And Rebecca says she's not kidding. And Miguel asks if that's a good idea, given the fact that with the medication, it might not be a good idea, for whatever reason. And Rebecca insists that one drink will not kill her. And it might save your life. And once again, the men in her life are sold on her logic. We cut to Randall and Madison talking over video chat. Randall has just gotten finished telling the story that we saw in Birth Mother. And Madison is blown away. Madison starts to feel pain in her stomach. Hopefully contractions and a sign that the babies are going to start coming. Randall suggests that now is the time to get a nurse. We cut to Toby who is making a list of names. When an older man tells him that Toby is in his spot. Which confuses Toby because there are spots all around the place. And Toby jokingly starts telling him about the setup that he's got going on. The elaborate setup. That would presumably be hard to break down. And start up again somewhere else. The older man. The driver is played by Michael O'Neill. Who I remember from the West Wing. And actually popped up on Grey's Anatomy. Where many viewers recognized him from. As the shooter. In one of the few episodes of that series that I actually saw. Things seem to be getting pretty tense, and Toby says, Buddy, I'm just waiting for my daughter to be born. And the older man says he's just waiting to find out if his wife is going to live or die. His wife has corona. I go back and forth whether including the coronavirus in movie and television narratives is really necessary. I can see solid arguments going both directions. I would venture to say that the fandom is split down the middle between people who wanted it included and people who didn't. To me, it seems like the definition of a lose-lose situation. Either way, you're going to aggravate a substantial amount of your audience. But since they did decide to include it in the narrative... They might as well do something with it other than the superficial and show the consequences of all these restrictions which we are seeing reflected in Toby's situation as well as 
this man that we just met, Toby's new friend. They might as well do something with it. So I rather liked that they showed something beyond the superficial consequences of the virus. And I ultimately quite enjoyed Toby's and this stranger's relationship. The man, played by Michael O'Neill, whose name is Arlo, I just looked that up by the way, says that that spot has numerical consequences for him, that his wife was heavily superstitious. So the number of the parking spot has meaning. And the guy eventually asked Toby, am I really going to have to ask you to move again? And Toby says, no sir, I am moving right now. After a scene in which we see Nazir welcoming his own kid into the world, we cut to Miguel and Rebecca. Miguel, who is coming back with a cocktail. And he says, Welp, these should be drinkable. That certainly inspires a lot of confidence in me. Rebecca takes a sip, and apparently it is very strong. Apparently, the liquor cabinet hasn't been updated in 20 years. Rebecca says that it tastes like car fuel. And Miguel says that she's, he seems to recall her taking one or two shots of this back in the day during their trip in Puerto Rico. And Rebecca says she was young, or rather married and happy. And I'm not sure if this meant that this was during their marriage or Jack's and hers marriage before he died. But she tells him to give an old lady a break. And this is actually a rather lovely scene between them. Their thread together is really nice and not something that we get too often in this series. She once again looks at the painting on the wall. And then we cut to the past timeline where we get an idea of exactly what that painting was. Rebecca is sorting, the younger Rebecca that is, is sorting through what appears to be the old artwork from the Big Three, which apparently has been leaked on thanks to the leak in the roof. As it turns out, it was a pipe in the upstairs bathroom that caused the damage. Jack says that he's going to go to the hardware store to get some something to fix the leak with. The artwork was apparently something that they were going to frame, but never quite got around to it. And Jack bemoans that everything seems ruined. Rebecca is all like, it's not like any of this was going to be hung on the mat or anything. And Jack, again, seems pretty annoyed. Rebecca asks him what the problem is. And Jack says, nothing, you've just been dunking on the kids all day. And Jack says to forget about it after Rebecca starts to object. That the box is clearly ruined. Everything in it is done. So just toss it and he'll go to the hardware store and picks the week. And he takes off. At this point in the episode, I'm still really not clear on what exactly Jack's problem is. But we will find out. Cut to the present day with Toby who gets a message from Kate saying that it's push time which drives him to his feet. And Arlo asks him what his deal is. And Toby says that the baby is on the way, but don't worry, he will stay in his area, in his zone. And then he notes some figurines in Arlo's car and asks if they're pigs. Arlo smiles and says that pigs are a thing with Rose, Rose being his wife that's upstairs on a ventilator, and who he isn't sure if he's, she's going to live or die. Arlo goes on to say that they went, on, they went to Australia during their honeymoon because that year The Sound of Music came out. She apparently wanted to see Salzburg. And Toby says that he gets it because she made Kate, he made Kate, move to the Pasadena just because of the Back to the Future house. This makes Arlo chuckle, and then he goes on to say that they were there for New Year's. As it turns out, Australians go all out for pigs on New Year's. Pig platters, pig chachas, the whole nine yards. And it is said that they bring good luck. And to start their marriage off right, they bought 
one of the pigs. And then over the years, they bought more. And the reason that all of those pigs were on his dashboard was because he figured that he needed all the luck he could get, so he brought the entire army with him. Arlo tells Toby that they might be able to take the his wife off the ventilator soon. And Toby says, hey, that's not nothing. And he takes a seat a little closer to Arlo's car. He asks if he's been able to go inside at all. And apparently he's not restricted by the hospital. He's restricted by his wife, who didn't want him to catch the virus as well. And Arlo, with some amusement, says that, you think I'm stubborn? You haven't met my Rose. And Toby laughing says that Kate can be kind of stubborn too. And Arlo asks, is that why you're out here? Because you got kicked out? And Toby goes on to say that nope. They are actually adopting. And there's only one visitor allowed. So that visitor ended up being Kate. But since she gets to be in the room, Toby gets to pick the middle name. With absolutely no veto power whatsoever from Kate. Arlo points out that that's a lot of pressure. And Toby says that he has quite a list going on. Toby says he doesn't want to pick it out just yet. He doesn't want to do so until the baby is officially theirs. Because he still has a fear that the birth mother will change her mind. And so do the rest of us at this point. In response, Arlo grabs one of the pigs after properly sanitizing it and tosses it to Toby and says it's one of Rose's favorites. For his good luck, of course. We cut to Madison, who is about to get an epidural. She makes the mistake of turning back to look at the needle. And Madison is all like, no, 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 you're not sticking that thing in me. Randall calls her attention and says to focus on him. He begins to tell a story. At first, about the time he would decide to become a congressman. Or rather, a city councilman. Sorry, I'm jumping the gun right there. I'm just assuming that's where Randall's eventually going to go. First Congress, then the presidency, and then the world. Anyway, that story quickly gets vetoed. So Randall instead decides to tell Madison the story of after junior prom. When Kevin comes home drunk, Randall intercepts him. And then brings him down to his room, takes off his shoes, and when Randall returns after, from getting some water, Kevin is butt naked, belting oombop at the top of his lungs. Randall keeps telling him to shut the heck up before they wake, or rather he wakes his parents, their parents. And suddenly Kevin stops. And then asks, why didn't we ever start a boy band? Like Hanson. We could be Pearson. We could be rock stars. The nurse says that she will experience a little pinch. Yeah, okay. A little pinch, sure. If that's what helps you sleep at night. Randall goes on to continue to distract Madison. And starts singing Mbop. And gets Madison to do it. Which is when the door opens to reveal Kevin. Alright, so it's kind of funny to me that we spent the last episode painfully tracking Kevin's journey to get to Madison. And we don't get any of that in this episode. We don't get the scene where somehow Kevin talks to the head of the TSA to get himself on that plane and it's not really needed uh, some fans were kind of annoyed with that but I don't think it's really something that we actually need to see but it is amusing to me that we didn't see that journey at all which no doubt was to keep up the suspense of whether Kevin was going to show up or not in time Madison and Kevin 
stare at each other. And all they have for to act out the scene is their eyes, because their faces are covered with masks. Randall is still singing, and Kevin eventually recognizes that it's him. Madison says to him, I want to hit you, but I want to kiss you too. And Kevin says, yeah, I get it. And Kevin says, sounds like you had some company though. And he sits down on the bed with Madison. Randall is on the monitor, and Madison says, yep, he's been on the phone with me for hours. He called to check up on me. And Kevin basically says, really? Sounding surprised at this development. Surprised and very, very touched. Kevin says, Randall, I don't know what to say. And Randall says, nothing required, man. I knew you would make it. Randall tells him that he is going to pass the torch. And he shows a shot of Beth on the video, who waves. And Randall says, hey, you got this, MCAT. And does a peace sign, which is so much like the old Randall, it's not even funny. Throughout this season, we've gotten little glimmers of the old goofy Randall that we don't see quite as much anymore, for whatever reason. And the call is ended. And Madison tells Kevin that she can't believe he actually made it. And Kevin says, in the only, the only glimpse we get of how that situation worked out, that he's going to have to put the TSA, the head of the TSA, on his Christmas list. Kevin goes on to say that none of his crazy night matters. The only thing that matters to him is, is that he made it. Before I left, you asked me how this family was going to fit into my life. And Kevin simply says that this family is his life. He quit the movie and he's not going to take any jobs that takes him away from her or his family. This, the beautiful babies that we are about to meet, this is all I'm ever going to need. And Kevin almost in a whisper says, I made it. And then Madison says, you made it. And she snuggles up next to him. And then we get a montage of Madison giving birth along with Ellie and Kate's baby. It's a surprisingly straightforward affair. And I think this is a good choice. We skip it. We've seen these scenes so many times with, you know, the birth birthing scenes. And I think just showing it in a montage is an effective choice here. And it's surprising me that they didn't even hint at Madison's life maybe possibly being at risk. There's none of that drama. The babies end up perfectly fine. There's no drama on that end. And in this series, we've seen plenty of instances where that's not the case. With the original Big Three when they were born, and Kate's baby, and the miscarriage. And I'm glad, honestly, that we just skip all over that. It's just, and all in all, just a feel-good episode. So all that speculation and concern among the fandom that Madison was going to die just turned out to be nothing. And there was a certain element of the fandom that wants Madison to, to die, to make way for Sophie or Cassidy or the mate of their choice for Kevin. There's some bloodthirsty assassins on the forums and in the Facebook groups. And this is my moment to say to you, those that are in that category, ha ha. But then we have a little moment after Ellie's baby is born, which is really Kate's, where Ellie says that she wants to hold the babies. And she changed her mind, and Kate obliges. There's a look of emotion and fear on her face. And there was fear in me as well. I'm like, oh, no, you're going to give in. You're going to do the whole cliche thing where she's going to change her mind at the last minute. No, don't do this. And Ellie asks to be alone with the baby for a moment. Uh-oh. Cut to Miguel and Rebecca playing Battleship. Rebecca is fretting because so far 
They've only gotten one picture of the twins from Kevin and Madison and nothing from Kate. Miguel simply says that when there's something to hear, I'm sure they'll hear it. Rebecca glances at the picture on the wall. And Miguel finally asks her about it. And he first referred to the painting as the blobs, which amused me to no end, by the way. We cut to the past timeline, where Rebecca is hanging the paintings on what looks like a laundry line, and Jack comes home. Rebecca shows him the effort she's making to try to save the artwork, but Jack tells him, tells her not to bother, that the paintings are ruined. And she finally asks what exactly Jack's issue is. That they always make fun of the kids. That's how they deal with the fact that the kids are teenagers and driving them nuts. And what it comes down to for Jack is that the kids are outgrowing with, growing them and that soon they won't want to hang out with them at all. They'll have their own lives and maybe they'll be lucky if they get a phone call every once in a while. Rebecca says that that's just not how it's going to be. And Jack reminds her that the two of them did that. That Jack left his family and never looked back. And so did she. Though that's actually not true for Rebecca so much. She did keep in contact. At least up until that Thanksgiving where Rebecca told her family that she wasn't going to come ever again. How much contact she had with her family after that is uncertain. But yes, what Jack is saying is what happens. The kids get older and they drift apart from their parents. They have separate lives. They see them less. But Rebecca promises that they will be there for every big moment in their kids' lives. Which unfortunately we know is not going to be true for Jack. And that painting on the wall is a reminder of that promise. And she feels that by not being there for her kids now, she is breaking that promise. That she is letting down Jack. Miguel starts to try to say something, and Rebecca tells him that he doesn't need to comfort her. That this is something that they never talk about. That Miguel has to bear Jack's death differently. For both himself and her. And our marriage. Thank you. I know it's a lot. And I know that I'm a lot. And Miguel assures her that she's just the right amount. And this scene is actually interesting because, I mean, it's a great scene. But it's also one of the rare times that we hear them discuss Jack. In fact, I can't think of another scene in this series where that happens. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I just don't remember, and maybe I will discover that scene upon rewatch. We cut to Ellie holding the baby that she just delivered. She says hi, and that, that the baby is the reason she's been skipping cold cuts for the last couple months. She just wants her to know that giving her up is the hardest thing she will ever have to do. But she is absolutely certain that giving her to Toby and Kate is the best decision for her that she could make. So the creators are not going in the direction of having her change her mind. But they are acknowledging that this situation is not an easy one for anyone involved. We cut to Kate. A door opens, and Kate turns towards the door, and a nurse delivers the baby. She gets to meet the baby and tell her that she is her mom. Kate tells her that she feels like she's waited her entire life to meet her. She can't wait to watch her grow up, to French braid her hair, to make sandcastles with her. She tells her, I gotta be honest, the world is a little nutty out there. But I can promise you this, you will never doubt your place in it. And I'm really excited for you to meet your dad. She takes out the phone to call Toby. 
via video chat. Toby picks up the phone excitedly and asks, Hey, do we have a baby? And soon enough, Toby gets to see. And Toby happily says, Hi there, Haley Rose. And he's holding the pig that he got from his new friend. And no, he did not name his daughter after a pig. He named his daughter after the wife of the person that he just met, his newfound friend. Some posters thought that Toby named her after a pig. And that's just not the case. You guys missed the point. Kate loves the name and thinks it's a Star Wars reference. But not quite. We cut to Randall and Beth. Randall is sleeping when the phone rings. And it's Kevin. Randall answers the phone and says, Well, how does it feel to be the Pearson family's newest dad? And Kevin laughs. And he says, Yeah, I, I can't believe I'm a dad, dude. And Beth congratulates Kevin as well. And Randall asks about names. And they have chosen Nicholas and Francis. Nicholas, of course, after Uncle Nicky. Now, this Uncle Nicky reference was enough for me to cover a gripe of mine through most of the season. Wondering where Uncle Nicky has been. Why haven't we seen him? He's eventually supposed to be at Rebecca's bedside. So, at some point, he has to come back into the story. It was enough for me to have him referenced here, but then we actually get to see him for a little bit. And Francis is after Madison's grandmother. Kevin goes on to mention that eight hours ago, he was dragging some random guy out of a car, and now here he is a dad. And Randall says, Yesterday, I was in New Orleans communicating with the spirit of my dead birth mom. And now I own her house. And Kevin simply says, damn. We got a lot to catch up on. Kevin confesses that he was terrified on the plane. Terrified that he wouldn't get there on time. Terrified that Madison would end up alone. And when he walked in the room, I heard your voice and man, and he pauses. And he simply just says, thank you. After everything we've been through recently. And all Randall says is, you're my brother. And Kevin says, I did say some pretty terrible things to you. But you are the best person that I know. And on my finest day, I am simply doing a poor man's imitation of you. And Randall says, we both said some terrible things. Tensions were high. And Kevin says, we have a lot of ground to cover. A lot of things I didn't see growing up, Kevin says emotionally. And it's kind of funny to me. It's not funny. It's, I rather like that they actually followed up the conversation from changes between Kate and Kevin. When Kate was telling him about Randall not feeling seen. And Kevin did not come across particularly well in that conversation. In fact, I almost made a video, a separate one, about how badly he came off in that conversation. But since then, he has redeemed himself somewhat in being willing to see what he didn't see before and seeing past the sibling rivalry between the two. And Randall says to him, if you really want to have that conversation with me, then I cannot wait to have that conversation. But now is not the time to have it. Now is time to celebrate your new family. And Kevin says yes. He takes a breath and then says, I cannot believe you told her the MBOP story. And Randall laughs. What a fantastic scene between these two. Honestly, for me, it was the best scene in the episode. I've been the most invested this season in where this particular relationship was going to go. And in Kevin and Madison. So this scene for me was just pure joy to watch. 
After we have our last Nazir scene, we cut to Rebecca and Miguel, who's just about to get news about the babies. The one Rebecca has been waiting to hear all this time. We then get a montage, which includes the origins of the painting that Rebecca had spending, spent so much time staring at throughout this episode. The entire family getting to meet the new babies. Kate referring to the kids as the new big three. Nikki getting to meet his nieces. And now we just need Nikki to come back into this story. I actually miss the character. I miss the actor. And as we see Toby celebrating his new daughter, we see Arlo talking to his wife. She survived. She got taken off the ventilator, and she is still alive. No tragedies in this episode. Just pure feel good. And like I said, that was just an absolutely fantastic episode. I'm a little bit worried about the next one. It's titled The Ride, and the promo is basically the kids, the big three, when they're babies, being taken home with Jack and Rebecca. And there's a shot of Jack getting a, a nipper, alcohol. Now, I don't necessarily mind bringing... Jack's alcoholism back into the story. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to dig the way they do it here during this particular time frame. Hopefully this is only a small part of the episode and not like a giant part of it. The promos have been pretty terrible through most of the season. In fact, I'd say all of it. Actually, the one for the previous episode there was actually pretty decent. Or no, I'm sorry. The one for this episode that we just watched is the good promo. Anyway, that's all I got for you for this episode. Anyway, if you like this video and want to support the channel, there are a number of ways to do so. You can follow me on Twitter at Corp Productions. You can join my Facebook group, Corman Productions. You can join my This Is Us Discussion Corman Productions page. All of those links will be provided in the video's description. In addition to that, you can buy something from the Corn Production Store on Zazzle, as well as Buy Me a Coffee, which is a new way to support content, content creators such as myself. And of course, you can like, share, and comment on this video, as well as subscribing to my channel. This is Dave from Corn Productions, signing off.